We hope you enjoyed that replay of Dr. Mukherjee's talk on head and neck spaces. Dr. Mukherjee is here live to take your questions, so we'll open the floor for any questions you may have. You can submit a question through the Q&A feature, and we will try to get to as many as we can before our time is up. Dr. Mukherjee, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. How much time do we have for the Q&A? Uh, you can go 10 minutes, 15 minutes, however you feel. Okay, sounds great. Um, hello, thanks again for having me. Um, let's see, we have a couple of questions in the question and answer. Again, thanks so much for uh, attending. We had uh, lots of registrations and a lot of uh, people attend, so it's it's fabulous. So the first question uh, I have are, uh, what are the keys to consider to differentiate chordomas from chondrosarcomas? So I saw that in the chat, and what I'll do is... Uh, I'll go ahead and bring this lecture up, and um, hopefully, is that Ashley on the screen? I don't know who's on there. Is that you, or who's on the screen? Yes, I'm here. Hey, it's going. So I'll just, I just wanted to, you can see my screen, is that right? Yep, we sure can. Okay, great. So um, it's a great question, and uh, I see a lot of questions popping up, so I'll try to get through these um, as quick as I can. Um so the thing about, so I'll just go this way, it's probably easier. You know, chordomas are malignant tumors that arise from the notochordal remnants. And, and it's always been confusing to me because when I hear notochord, I actually think of the spinal cord. But in actuality, the notochord is the, is the precursor to the spine itself. So this, it, it goes all the way up from the clivus and the basic sphenoid all the way down to the tip of the sacrum. So as a result, if, if you don't think of chordoma as the cord and you just remember chordoma as the area where the spine develops, that really is one of the key features that helps me, meaning that chordomas actually arise from the embryolo uh, embryological um, determinants um, of the notochord. So as a result, when we do look at chordomas, Chordomas tend to be midline lesions because they arise from, from the spinal cord. And they also tend to have this pseudo, uh, if you will, I always call it this sort of a pseudo cystic appearance. And that's because they tend, they, they create fissiliferous cells. So they tend to be cystic on T2, which they're really not because they contain a lot of mucin. Um, and they also enhance with contrast. So there's, they, they are solid, but they but they tend to be midline. Another example here, you look at this and you think it's cystic, but in actuality, when you end up giving con T1 weighted images and with contrast, you can see that it's enhancing. So so they're midline lesions. Now, if I fast forward to um, the the chondrosarcomas, chondrosarcomas arise paramidline, and they tend to arise from this area just to the, the left of midline, which is the petroclival synchondrosis. So chordomas tend to be a little bit more paramidline, and they also oftentimes will have what my uh, musculoskeletal folks refer to as rings and circles. Um, and they tend not to have that, if you will, that pseudocystic appearance. On T2, they can either be low signal, they can be high signal, and that T2 signal really depends on the actual elements. But in, as a rule of thumb, chordomas tend to be more paramidline as opposed uh, to, to midline, and they have this, if you will, no, new bone formation. So the next question that I got, well, we have so many right now, I'll try to get these as quick as I can, is um, how do you differentiate between pleomorphic adenomas and Worthen's tumors? Um, so let me uh, try to exit out of this one. Uh, there we go. And I'll try to share a different screen because I saw that pop up when I was looking at this. And this actually goes back to the, the lecture that you just saw. So this is what helps me differentiate um, pleomorphic adenomas from Worthen's tumors. And literally, this just came up yesterday in, um, in, the, in the tumor board that I attend. So Worthen's tumors, uh, the other name, if you remember this, I think this kind of helps you. The name for Worthen's, other name for Worthen's tumors is called cystadenoma lymphomatosum. And what that means is the lymphomatosum means that it actually arises from lymphoid tissue. And in the parotid gland, they're actually intraparotid lymph nodes, and they arise in four levels. They arise anterior to the tragus, so it's pretragal, below the parotid capsule, so they're subcapsular along the facial nerve, 
and then also in the tail of the parotid gland. So there are four different areas. So lymph nodes tend to be multiple, they tend to be bilateral, and they have a propensity for the parotid tail. So because Worthen's tumors arise from that lymphoid tissues, if I see something that's arising in the parotid tail or something that's multiple, then I start thinking about Worthen's tumors. Now, on the other hand, if I see something that is high signal on T2, and in general tends to arise from the body of the parotid gland, tends to be unilateral, um, and it, it basically stays away from the tail of the parotid gland, then I think of pleomorphic adenomas. So sometimes it can be hard for sure, but to answer your question specifically, is something's high signal on T1, excuse me, high signal on T2 that's solid, and that sort of arises in the main portion of the parotid gland, I start thinking about pleomorphic adenomas. But on the other hand, if I see something that is um, multiple, bilateral, and especially involves a parotid tail, then that really um, tends to uh, favor uh, Worthen's tumors. So the next question that came up was, uh, you mentioned that pleomorphic adenomas are the most common uh, tumors of the parapharyngeal space. What glandular structure do they originate from? Um, and that's a really great question. And, and the way that I think of this is as follows. Um, the most the head and neck structures the, um, that form the regular fibro fatty area and the muscles are pretty ubiquitous. They, are, they occur anywhere in the body. Now, there are certain areas in the head and neck that arise to, you know, what I would refer to as the head and neckish tumors and specifically salivary gland lesions. So the reason why pleomorphic adenomas are the most common tumors of the parapharyngeal space is that during embryology, you can have these small little rests of minor salivary gland tumors that tend to embed themselves in the parapharyngeal space. And as a result, when you have those little areas of, of ectopic salivary gland tissues, this is what gives rise to things like pleomorphic adenomas, or occasionally you'll see adenoid cystic carcinomas, et cetera. But in general, pleomorphic adenomas are the most common tumors that arise from these ectopic rests. And the, because these ectopic rests are located in the parapharyngeal space, this is what gives rise to pleomorphic adenomas. So the next question that I had was, um, how do we differentiate necrotic retropharyngeal lymph nodes from abscesses? So let me go ahead and um, stop my share because I saw this one too while um, the talk was going on. And let's see here, help me out here. How do I stop my share? Let's see, oops, sorry about that. Um, right at the top of your screen. There we go. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it gets lost there. Yeah. there we go. Thank <laughs> you. So we'll go to this next one. And I think I pulled that one up. Again, another great question that was um, pertinent to this talk. So uh, we'll start with this. Can you, uh, can you see my screen? Is that a, is yep. that a yes? That's okay. perfect. So when, when we start looking at the head and neck structures, we already talked about the visceral space. So I think the way I said, if you say, ah, anything that you look in your mouth is in the visceral space. Then we talked about this fascial layer and this fascial layer has different names to it. You can either call it the visceral fascia or the pharyngomucosal fascia or the buccal or the pharyngobasal pharyngo fascia. There's so many names to it. In fact, the names have been changing for the last 250 years, and I assume in the next 20 years, there may be another name. I mean, who knows? But the important thing to know is that there is this fascial layer that separates the visceral space from the spaces behind the pharynx. And where these little green dots are, those are the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So what happens when you have an infection involving the tonsils um, and the pharynx, the primary drainage ends up going to the medial and the lateral retropharyngeal lymph node and they have a propensity for the lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So the first area of infection are going to be the deposition here, this pus involving the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And this is what we refer to appropriately as suppurative adenitis. This is not an abscess, but it is suppuration or pus within the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Then as they grow, I always think of them as water balloons. So as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the water balloons pop, and then all of a sudden you end up getting pus in the retropharyngeal space. So this is a true retropharyngeal space abscess. Now, when you have a retropharyngeal space abscess, 
if it gets worse and worse and worse, it can grow posteriorly and eventually erode into the top of the spine. So this, and specifically at C1 and C2. So here we have this retropharyngeal space abscess extending posteriorly to involve the spine. And if you look closely, it's actually extending into the epidural space. And then when you could give contrast, you can see this epidural space abscess. So here, when you give contrast, you can see the fluid collection in the retropharyngeal space. Then you have this erosion of the spine, and then you have the epidural collection in the anterior spinal canal. So that's the difference between separative adenitis and retropharyngeal space abscess. And that is the normal, if you will, pathophysiology and spread patterns of the retropharyngeal space infections. So the next question, uh, wow, we have a lot, keep them coming in. So the next question <clears throat> that I have is, um, what is your experience with Delphian lymphadenopathy in children? And the bottom line is, it's not very common. Uh, most of the Delphian lymph nodes, so when we mean Delphian lymph nodes, what these Delphian lymph nodes are, is that they are the pretracheal lymph nodes. So they're technically a level six lymph nodes and they're located anterior to the trachea. And I haven't had much experience of these in children. The few times that I have seen it has probably been in patients with tuberculosis. In the old days, we would talk, call uh, tuberculosis of the neck. The term that we used to use was scrofula. So I think in, in occasionally, uh, I assume these tuberculosis of the neck, the scrofula could involve the expected location of the Delphian lymph nodes, but in general, uh, not much uh, experience in kids. Most commonly, I see them in, in adults, and there are usually due to uh, recurrences in head and neck cancer. Specifically, I've seen it in squamous cell carcinoma and in thyroid carcinoma. And it's not the initial recurrence. Oftentimes, it's patients that have been treated um, with head and neck cancers, with squamous cell carcinomas, with multiple treatments. And eventually, the uh, Delphian lymph nodes end up getting involved, oftentimes because they're not involved in standard neck dissections and the radiation therapist may not particularly focus on the pretracheal lymph nodes during treatment. So the next question was the differentiate between retropharyngeal space abscess and cellulitis. So let me bring um, that. Ashley, we doing okay with time or, or what? You Absolutely. Me. You go as long as you'd like to. Okay. I, if you got other, if you got to be somewhere else, let me know. Um, so uh, ag again, another another great question. Um, and uh, so let me let me bring this up. And uh, let's see here. Yeah. So I think this is probably the best example here. So can you see my screen, Ashley? Yes. Okay, great. So <clears throat> that that it really is an, an excellent question. Um, and this is an example of edema, or sometimes we use the term retropharyngeal space effusion. So this is oftentimes associated with CPPT disease involving uh, the dens, and we call this calcific tendinitis. And so edema involving the retropharyngeal space, it tends not to have as much mass effect. It can have some mass effect, but not a lot. But it tends to be, you know, it's kind of fuzzy and hazy and very, very symmetric. And with the leap of faith, this, this where my arrow is pointing at right now actually identifies the ALR fascia. So the alar fascia is not always seen, but if I see this low attenuation here and I see the alar fascia, then that really makes me 100% sure that I'm dealing with edema. Now, on the other hand, when we start looking at retropharyngeal space abscesses, and I'll show a more um, classical example, here we can see there's fluid, there's midline, and it has much more mass effect. So there really is a definable collection here. Whereas before, when we talk about retropharyngeal space edema, it's not as well defined, it's a little bit more symmetric, and it's a little bit more separated. Now, if you don't see a lot of head and neck, um, and, um, and you see something like this, and you're not sure, um, my feeling it's always better to err on being more conservative and suggesting the possibility of an abscess, as opposed to not, and then being wrong, and it is, because that can lead to more problems. But um, you know, so if you're not sure, then it's probably better to just 
uh, at least raising the possibility, because what you don't want to do is that you don't want to say that something is not an abscess and it turns out that it actually is an abscess. So that's where I would sort of um, titrate, if you will, or, or set my rheostat. Let's see. So that was the ones that I saw before. <clears throat> um, now what I see here is if you evaluate subglottic symptoms, do you have them scan and with expiration saying E to evaluate the trachea? <clears throat> so again, a terrific question. In general, I don't. I think um, when you are evaluating patients with subglottic stenosis, the main thing is there is there an anatomic um, narrowing in the region of the subglottis. And I think that can be evaluated just with standard imaging. You know, I think I mentioned before, I actually see patients every week. In fact, Wednesdays is the days I see patients in, in our head and neck clinic. And so I'm actually in there when they perform the endoscopies and the laryngoscopies. Um, and so I can actually see the ease and the reverse ease and the, and the effect that it actually has on the vocal cord. And I know oftentimes we will say this in radiology, should we do these vocal cord procedures? Um, but in general, I don't think they're necessarily very helpful because you know when the surgeons do perform an endoscopy, they can, they can actually see the vocal cords move. So from my standpoint, uh, at least my opinion is, is that you can do this if you want to, but in general, you know, what we are looking for is an anatomic cause <clears throat> of the subglottic stenosis. And I don't, I'm not sure how much the vocal cord manipulations um, will, will help with that. Uh, <clears throat> the next question is how do we differentiate a glandular lesion from intraglandular lymph adenopathy? Um, I have to admit, I'm not sure what that means. Um, maybe if you could provide a little bit more detail, I can, I can answer that. Um, but I don't want to give a tangential answer. So, uh, if Dr. Preetha is still on, you can just maybe, uh, type that question again. Uh, the next question is the infratemporal fossa versus the retromaxillary space. So let me bring up the spaces talk here. Um, there's the spaces of the neck talk. Let's see. Oops, hold on for a second. I didn't do my share. Sorry about that. Um, spaces, there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> in general, the way to think about it is, let's see, you should be seeing the screen. Can you see it, Ashley? I can see it, yep. Great, okay. So <clears throat> again, in, in the head and neck, what we end up doing is that we give different pieces, oops, sorry about that, different pieces of anatomy the same name. So when we look at, we should do it. When we look at the masticator space, this really is synonymous with the infratemporal fossa. So anytime you see infratemporal fossa, basically just think masticator space. Now, when you talk about the retromaxillary space, it, when I think of the retromaxillary space, it's not really a true space. I just think of this more as a descriptor. It's any of this region right here behind the maxillary sinus. So if I see the maxillary sinus and someone says the retromaxillary space, what that usually indicates to me, it would include this area right here. So that would include the, our little foramen right here, which is the sphenopalatine foramen, the pterygopalatine fossa, and the pterygomaxillary fissure. And if you want to, it could probably include also some of the muscles of mastication, the, the anterior portion of the muscles of mastication. So in general, the infratemporal fossa to me is synonymous with the masticator space. And then the retromaxillary space, if you will, is this that little area right here that's immediately posteriorly to the max immediately posterior to the maxillary signs. <clears throat> um, please shed some light on the buccal space. Sure. So the buccal space is actually um, kind of an interesting space. Um, it, if you will, it probably doesn't get enough love, if you will. So the buccal space, uh, let me bring that up right here, is essentially this area right here. So on the schematic illustration, it actually defines it pretty well. So ignore the area in red. 
But the buccal space is this area that's lateral to this clinical area that we refer to as the gingival buccal sulcus. So what is the gingival buccal sulcus? The gingival buccal sulcus is the gingiva, which lines the, uh, is the mucosal line of the maxillary and the mandibular alveolar ridge. So basically it's our maxilla and our jaw. Then you have the buccal area, which is the mucosal layer lying the inner portion of the cheek. So this is actually when you look in someone's mouth. So that's what we refer to as the gingiva buccal sulcus. Now, if we extend more laterally and we actually get into, if you will, the cheek structures, then we get into the buccal space. So the buccal space is, is the skin, and then we have the overlying soft tissues, and then we have this deep fat right here. So for me, the buccal space is this area right here, which is lateral to the maxilla, max, maxil, maxillary alveolar ridge, and lateral to that, and then medial to the mandible. And this fat right here is sometimes known as the buccal fat pad or the deep portion of the buccal space. The buccal space also contains this little duct right here, which schematically would represent Stenson's duct. We have these superficial muscles of facial expression, which include muscles like the obicularis oris. And then we have peripheral branches of the seventh nerve. And because we're in the buccal area, these are the buccal branches of the facial nerve. So when I think of the buccal space, I think of this sort of rhomboid or triangular area of fibro fatty tissue, which is lateral to the maxillary alveolar ridge and just medial to the ramus of the mandible that tends to extend uh, posteriorly. All right. Um, how do we differentiate between uh, deep low parotid tumors and parapharyngeal lesions? Okay, so that's a, another great question. And again, I'm glad you asked it because it's always been and it a always has been, <clears throat> excuse me, and continues to be an area of confusion. So what I will do is I will give you historically what I was taught. Uh, with the understanding that I'm sure, you know, people will give you, if you will, different opinions. I've got a nice example, I think, right here. So this uh, is a, let's see, you can still see, right, Ashley, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. So just to, um, just to reiterate, let me go back one. Ah, yes, perfect. So just to reiterate, Here's the triangular portion of the parotid gland here, and then this is the retromandibular vein. And just lateral to the retromandibular vein is going to be the facial nerve. So when we look at the facial nerve, here's the main trunk of the facial nerve, and these are the various branches. So, you know, I had the privilege of being in Africa recently. So the mnemonic that I use is, is actually to Zanzibar by motor car. So two is the temporal branch of the facial nerve. Z, Zanzibar, is the zygomatic branch. Bi is going to be the buccal branch. Motor is going to be the marginal mandibular branch. And car is going to be the cervical branch. So, so to Zanzibar by motor car. So that's the plane that separates the superficial from the deep lobe of the parotid gland. Now, when we look more deeply to the parotid gland, now we're going to see the parapharyngeal space. So the question that we get into is whether or not a mass like this is actually involved in the deep lobe of the parotid gland, or is it actually involving the parapharyngeal space? So in this particular case, this was a pleomorphic adenoma. And notice how this mass right here is extending through this area that it's located between the styloid process and the mandible. And this little area right here is referred to as the stylomandibular tunnel. So if I see a pleomorph, or if I see a mass right here that is extending through the stylomandibular tunnel, what we're classically taught is that if you see something extending through that tunnel, then this is a deep lobe parotid gland mass extending into the parapharyngeal space. In fact, if you look at the opposite side, here's the mandible here. The styloid process is going to be right about there. In fact, that probably is a styloid process. So there's our stylomandibular tunnel, and you can see just a smidgen right here of deep lobe of parotid tissue. So you can see that if something arose from here, this would involve the stylomandibular tunnel. Now, if I show this case, 
Notice how this mass is not really extending through the stylomandibular tunnel. It sort of gets to that tunnel and it stops. So this mass is isolated in the parapharyngeal space. And it does make a difference in how these patients are treated because some surgeons, if it's involving the parapharyngeal space, they may, or the deep lobe, they may wish to just do a total parotidectomy through a parotid approach. But if we know that there's a substantial amount of involvement of the parapharyngeal space or arising in the parapharyngeal space, then some uh, surgeons may elect to do a mandibular swing procedure because that will give them better access to the parapharyngeal space. So for me, it's how much of this extension is going through the stylomandibular tunnel. And if everything is medial to that stylomandibular tunnel, then that suggests that it's a primarily arising from the parapharyngeal space. Dr. McCurdy, how about one yeah. or two more and then we'll wrap up for the day? Does that sound okay? okay? Yeah, it sounds great. Um, boy, oh boy. Should we just do it by who came first or when yeah. you... <laughs> Perfect, uh, yeah. It's, it's nice to have all this uh, interest, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Let's see, on lymphoma PET CTs, is the bilateral FDG of VIDI the parotid glands normal physiologic uptake or an indication of lymphomatous involvement? Again, another great question. If there is just diffuse uptake in the parotid glands, just diffusely uptake in the parotid glands, then that's usually indicative of just normal physiological uptake. Because the parotid glands contain individual lymph nodes, if I see a PET CT scan and I see multiple focal areas of increased uptake within the parotid glands, like little balls, cannonballs, or ping pong balls, or now we can call them pickle balls, I guess, within the parotid gland that are round, then that's more suggestive of lymphoma. Whereas if it's diffuse uptake in the parotid glands, then that's really more indicative of physiological uptake. And then um, the next one's really quick. Will it be wrong to call a masticator space lesion as infratemporal lesion? The answer is no. I, I use the terms masticator space and infratemporal um, uh, interchangeably. The next one real quick, uh, that's quick. What all spaces are the infratemporal fossa consist of? The infratemporal fossa is essentially the masticator space like we talked about before. So um, should we just stop there? And then uh, if we want to, um, Ashley, we can do a repeat of this uh, later if you want, or maybe another talk or something like that.